Three minutes after nine on Monday, January the 7th, and a new year and a new opportunity to call Jacob Rees. Well, I remind you, as if you need reminding, he's, of course, Conservative MP for North East Somerset. But importantly, in the context of today's conversation, he chairs the all-important Conservative European Research Group, or ERG, as it's known. And I understand that uh, your group, or indeed one of your colleagues, is releasing a paper, Mr. Rees. Welcome to the show. Happy New Year to you and your family, first off. What can you tell us about this paper? Thank you, and likewise, um, Happy you. New Year to you and your, your Thank family. You. Um, the the paper has been produced by Peter Lilly, yep. who was um, trade secretary uh, some years ago, and therefore he's a great expert in this field. Really putting to bed some of the scare stories about WTO and what would happen if we leave to WTO terms. Starting with the idea that it's not crashing out, but it's cashing in because you'd save thirty nine billion pounds of taxpayers' money that you wouldn't have to pay if we went to WTO terms. But other things such as the EU wouldn't be able to put a punitive tariff on the UK's goods that didn't apply to the rest of the world. So yes, it could apply the common external tariff, but it couldn't say, well, these goods are from nasty Britain, and therefore we're not letting them through Calais, or we're applying a punitive tariff, because that's not allowed under the WTO rules, and the EU is actually pretty good at sticking to its international agreements. OK. What else is it that my, that in your report, or sorry, your group's report, that my listeners should take note? Well, well the trade will carry on because people want to trade is an underlying uh, assumption. And it's essentially 30 points of rumours and scare stories that they will have heard that aren't true. So it's basically a WTO mythbuster to give people comfort that trading on the WTO uh, is a sensible thing to do. And it reminds everybody that our trade on WTO terms has grown faster than our trade with the EU since... But the it's single a smaller percentage, yeah, that, it's a that, smaller that, base, I would imagine, Mr. rees uh, Not anymore, it isn't. That, that it used to be, you're quite right. But when the single market was established, the EU was comfortably over 50% of our trade. Uh, it's now well below that, and our non-EU trade is heading towards 60%, which is primarily WTO or WTO-based. There are side agreements around the WTO, but a lot of these don't actually relate to trade. So I think there are... Um, nearly a hundred side agreements with Russia on how you trade with Russia, but uh, half of those are separate from the specifics of WTA trade. Coming to the first call, Krishna, you'll be the first call in just a moment. F final point, as you and I are speaking, Mr Rees-Mogg, if you, if you look at the monitors, the television screens, you will see that there's coverage of this Operation Brock, which is this test using Manston and a former RAF base. They're holding lorries in Kent and then seeing if they can hold them there as a sort of pen before going down to the ports. Meanwhile, dredgers are in action in Ramsgate to possibly make room for a ferry service that the company has commissioned that doesn't have any ships. Is this the Brexit my listeners and your supporters voted for? Uh, the key point made by people who are likely to be your listeners that's been made to me over Christmas uh, is that they voted to leave. And that's what will happen on the 29th of March. Whether there is um, this withdrawal agreement or whether it's on WTA terms, the key is that we leave. And that, I think, is what people voted for. A leave like this, Mr Rees-Mogg? Dredgers working with ferry companies that doesn't have any ships? Lo a lorry park in Kent? But I don't see what your... piles of medicines? But the Secretary of State for Health has said that there won't be any problem with medicines being delivered to people. It's surely sensible to make preparations for unknown eventualities. And you always prepare for things that may go wrong, not that things are certain to go wrong. A bit late. So I appreciate the timing wasn't from you, but no. shouldn't this possibly have been commenced about a year ago? Th that's a very good case to be made that things should have started earlier. But of course you make preparations that not everything will go according to plan. Nothing in life no. ever does. No. And the job of government is to be prepared. L look at what happened at Gatwick just before Christmas with the drones. Because of that, airports are now making preparations for drone activity to a much greater degree than they did before that happened. What is being done in terms of leaving on the 29th of March is making preparations for things that may happen that are unknown, and that is a prudent course of action. The one thing that we can always count, of course, is the Queen's Christmas message. But that, that one thing always, Mr Rees-Mogg, does go through without any impatient course. We go to the first call. Krishna is in Finchley. Krishna, you're through to Jacob Rees-Mogg. Your question. Good morning to you. Right. Good morning, gents. Uh, morning, Nick, good morning, uh, Mr Rees-Mogg. Good, good morning, morning Krishna. Uh, right. Good morning. Uh, what question? I've got a couple of, th well, three things that I want to point out first before I put my question to you. Uh, the Government's Migration Advisory Committee... Uh, propose that anyone earning less than £30,000 uh, will have difficulties or will be banned uh, actually from coming into the UK uh, to work 
which has been uh, sort of term in, uh, which, which, which has been termed as an ignorant and elitist policy to get only the skilled migrants from uh, the uh, European continent. I speak on behalf of a company that I, I run, which is a, a, a labor-intensive industry, and I'm also very strongly affiliated in the uh, voluntary sector with uh, restaurants and uh, catering. We see that the labor market in this country at the lower tier is very much made up. Three in five workers, in fact, for, are from uh, the European continent. I've got to start but to I'm move a... you towards your question, if I may, sir. What would yes. your question be, please? Thank you. The question would be Thank that you. why are we putting so much restriction on the lower-skilled workers, whereas we, the companies, need these people to work in our industry? Because when we put out an advertisement in, in, in the newspapers or on the windows or, or, or word of mouth or the job centres, we don't get anybody from the homegrown sector coming in and asking for the employment position that we offer, but right. from the uh, European continent. Don't go. I just want to get Mr. Rees-Mogg involved. Jacob Rees-Mogg. Well, thank you. It's an interesting question that you raise as to why would you set a skills limit or a, a salary limit for uh, work visas. The difficulty with unrestrained migration from the European Union is the effect it's had on the least well-off in the United Kingdom, people who are already here. And that although businesses have to some extent benefited because it's held wages down, the other side of that bargain, the people employed, have had their wages held down. So you see the least well-off in our society have not seen their um, take-home pay increase over the last 20 years very much. And that that is something that as a society we should be concerned about. And taking control of our borders and particularly uh, reducing the number of lower paid jobs that are available to people from outside the UK will help the least well-off in this country. But what about Krishna needing his staff and colleagues and others who run industries, trades, jobs, businesses like them? Where do they? Get, what are they going to do? Well, it's a question of supply and demand, and that if you wish to create uh, the um, supply, you have to pay more. So there will be increases in pay for the least well-off in our society. Did you and agree with that 30,000 cap, that rather arbitrary figure? I think you need to look at some figure, whether it's 30,000 or um, 29,000 or 31,000, uh, it can be argued about, but I think the basic point that immigration is not a problem for really high-skilled jobs. It's not a problem for scientists going to work at universities. It is a problem for the least well-off in our society who find uh, that the jobs that they would have got are now only paying an amount that attracts people from overseas and not people who uh, are living in this country already. And if you and I were running a series of coffee shops or hotels, might we not be rather concerned we won't have any young people to make the beds or make the coffees? You and I, when we go into coffee shops, may have to pay a little bit more for our cups of coffee to ensure that the, the least British. well-off of uh, our own society... So our, gets slightly our fellow better. countrymen and women come and make the coffee and make the beds? Look, we will have a choice. Are we going to look after the least well-off in our society by benefits taken from us through taxation? or by ensuring that the jobs that are available pay them an amount of money that means they can live in our society without that level of benefit. Let's get a response from Krishna. Krishna, a quick response from you, sir, before I move yes, on. Quick, yes, very quickly. Uh, the uh, point about the low paid in this country and looking after them, I totally appreciate it, and I think we should hand out and help people uh, in the lower paid sector or whoever they are that, that don't have jobs. But the, the, the acid test, uh, Mr. rees is the fact that if you uh, look, it's not just about the money, it's about the cultural thing, that if people do not want to do the hard grafting, the labor-intensive sweat work, we are offering people not the minimum wage, the London wage. Sometimes we go over the top and offer a little bit more. Still, they're not interested. One day they will come and the second day they'll say they're sick or they're not well or whatever. These people that come from abroad, the, the continent, they are so reliable that we can put our shops to their hands and say, look, there's the keys, run our shops for us. Let's get That's a, the type of... I hear, I hear what you say, this I extraordinary dedication, perhaps by people who realise they're rather lucky to come to a country, whereas you could argue some perhaps rather take it for granted, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Well, I'd say that I've worked with lots of very reliable British people who turn up to work and work extremely hard. Doubt I doubt that you've worked uh, in a I'm, coffee shop, I'm, Mr Rees-Mogg. No, I haven't worked in a coffee shop. I'm a, I'm a little suspicious uh, of... Um, this idea that the British aren't willing to work and are fundamentally lazy. I don't think it's true. I think there are inevitably some of us uh, who are more idle than, than others. But why are all the coffee shops full of Romanians and Poles and Portuguese kids? Um, because it's a very attractive first job to get if you've just got into the country and it tends to be relatively lowly paid compared to other jobs.
What's attractive about having to get up at five in the morning to make the sack of sandwiches, stack the sandwiches and make a cup of tea? Well, you're earning three times what you would earn if you were in Romania. Why doesn't the British kid do that? Because he's not earning three times what he would get in Romania. Chris is in Twickenham. Chris, you're on the radio. Good morning. 